and welcome to PM Express. My name is Nana Ansakwa, but obviously you know the setting has changed and I have got absolutely fantastic guests lined up for you today. Well, we are at the Pan-African Conference on Iniquities in the context of structural transformation. Then you know that obviously it's an, Af it's an African conference. When you hear all the big English and all the big formation, you should know you're in Africa. But it all means well. Obviously, when you hear Pan-Africanism, it all means well. But who have I caught up with? I caught up with Lord Paul Yabuating or Baron Boating, uh, born June 14, 1951. He's a British Labour Party politician who was the member of parliament uh, for Brent South from uh, 1987 to 2005, becoming the UK's first mixed race cabinet minister in May 2002 uh, when he was appointed as chief secretary to the treasury. Following his departure from the House of Commons, he served as the uh, British High Commissioner to South Africa from March 2005 to May 2009 and he was introduced as a member of the House of Lords uh, in July 2010 till day. Baron, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Nana, but you've missed out the most important thing. I'm an Accra Academy old boy. My, my old why school. Why wasn't that mentioned <laughs> right up there in front of you know, all my, uh, my, old my other school. achievements? Bello, you know, <laughs> Bello. So he's a product of Ghana. He's a product of Ghana. Well, Paul, welcome. Thank you very much, Nana. Paul, are you... I was just going to say, is this one conference too many? Uh, in the age of information, we have it all in front of us that we know that the world needs the resources from Africa. We know that Africa has got manpower and indeed is a young manpower. Uh, and all we have to do is trust each other and trade amongst us rather than always rely on the IMF and the World Bank and the donors because there's so much they can do for you. What is stopping us? I mean, and we keep inviting you because of your... So come and talk to us, come and talk to us. Is it one too many? Well, the people in government of Ghana should be congratulated for hosting this Pan-African conference uh, because it's part and parcel of a process of ensuring that Africa's voice is heard in the global discussion around uh, the future uh, of the Millennium Development Goals, the future of sustainable development in the world. Uh, and Ghana's uh, voice and Ghana's role in convening uh, such a conference with an opening address by uh, the head of state with the contribution of Ghana civil society, Ghana business, uh, the Ghana government alongside uh, the, the uh, peoples uh, of Africa as a whole is very important in making sure the voice is heard because we are in the process uh, of witnessing a global phenomenon and Africa is suffering from that and that phenomenon is economic growth uh, and after all when you look at the top uh, 10 uh, fastest economies uh, fastest growing economies in the world African economies make up at least half of them by by any measure so the economy of Africa is is growing and yet inequality within the continent is growing and this is a profoundly damaging phenomenon because it's a threat to social and economic justice and it's a threat also to the sustainability uh, of uh, growth. So Ghana is right to be hosting this conference. The important thing, however, is that it should be a conference that is focused on action. Uh, we've got plenty of analysis, as you've pointed out in your opening remarks, good analysis. What we now want is action and service delivery in ways that reduces uh, inequalities and promotes uh, sustainable development. Paul, you're an experienced politician, so I, I don't need to tell you that we have a serious deficiency when it comes to implementation. We, we just can't seem to get our ideas on the road and get moving. What can we do to get these ideas on the road and move? Now, now I'm a retired politician. <laughs> and one of the things that I've learned in the course of a lifetime uh, in, in politics is that it doesn't uh, do to lecture uh, from one country. Uh, the politicians uh, of another. So I'm not in the business of coming to conferences like this and giving lectures on what's to be done. But what I do know and what I do have some grasp of uh, in terms of my experience uh, politically and diplomatically is what works. Mm -hmm. And what I see as more likely to work 
is if you have a determined focus on delivery, if you measure uh, outcomes, uh, don't rely simply on inputs, it's if you measure uh, quality. So you need data, you need effective data. The stats, the figures are important. You need then also to have a rigorous set of priorities. You have to determine what is important uh, to you, what's important to the country. And in order to establish national priorities or continental priorities, you need consultation. Mm. And you need to get out there and listen to the people. And you have to build then partnerships for delivery that involve the public sector, the private sector, civil society, and that uh, recognize that the context in which delivery takes place has to be transparent and accountable. If that road isn't built, if the water supply isn't re rehabilitated, then somebody has to answer for that. Uh, and at the end of the day, too, uh, the resources have to be found for that water supply. The resources have to be found for that road or that rail link, uh, for that uh, investment in seeds or agricultural extension. And that's where the budgetary process comes in. And I'm a former Chief Secretary to the UK, uh, to the Treasury in the UK. Uh, and so I learned in the course of successive uh, budgets that successful budgets, too, are the process of consultation. Successful budgets, too, require a rigorous attention to the issue of how you are going to raise the revenue. And one of the issues that's being discussed at this conference is how we have a more progressive taxation system how those who are able to pay their taxes uh, come to be required to pay their taxes, how we give a greater focus and attention to the whole process of budget making and revenue collection. And that means not relying simply uh, on VAT. It means looking at personal income tax. It means looking at corporate uh, taxation, making sure that the mining and the mineral extraction companies pay their fair share of taxation, not only in Ghana, but, uh, uh, but globally. So these are some of the practical issues that this conference is addressing. And I think it's a, it's, it's a great step forward. Uh, that Ghana has convened uh, this conference here and now we want to see delivery based on the analysis uh, and the policy prescriptions that have been shared at this conference. Paul, I hear, you know, you've, you've given a fantastic submission, but here in Ghana, you know, we are running a democracy which is based on a Western American type of democracy. And you talked about data, you talked about statistics, you know, and I'm going to add, you know, uh, identification of citizens, uh, housing mm -hmm. deficits, and uh, uh, expanding the revenue base. Mm. Can a country, should we put a hold and say, listen, let us at least get data in there, let us at least identify, because at the moment, unless a child wants to find a passport and then check himself out of the country, he's probably not on any uh, database whatsoever mm -hmm. and how then do, does a country you know project or even make any for your treasury I mean if you were going to ask how many disabled girls do I have so I can buy wheelchairs for mm -hmm. them we won't be able to even give you the number so that with all good intents and purpose you can't even help the country I mean should we put a hold on our vigorous politicization of everything get these basics and then go back to politics because I just think that our politics is hindering everything how can you live in 2014 and a citizen hasn't got an ID well, uh, that's a matter for uh, the political process to address uh, that's a matter for uh, Parliament uh, to uh, debate uh, that's a matter for uh, parliamentary scrutiny and ministers government held to account that's the stuff uh, of uh, uh, democracy uh, and you know at the end of the day there has to be a fora in which national priorities are set and for a democratic country like Ghana or the United Kingdom that uh, forum uh, is, is, is Parliament 
There's a budgetary process, there's a scrutiny uh, uh, process. The issue of the, let me, let's take the example of statistics, which is an important one. Uh, the issue of the allocation of resources to the National Statistics Office and to the Chief Statistician is an issue that can be and should be addressed uh, in, in Parliament. Uh, and it's a matter of priorities. Politics is about priorities. And the people of Ghana, in my experience, uh, have uh, and embrace uh, vigorous debates about politics. And uh, I celebrate that, that fact. I don't think Ghana should be taken to task uh, for being um, overtly political. Uh, all politicians, whatever their party, have to be taken to task when there is a failure to deliver. And that is what the active citizen does. And the active citizen is not just a citizen during uh, elections. The active citizen is a citizen in between elections, working through traditional leadership and traditional um, fora, working uh, through um, not-for-profit and civil society uh, organizations, associations, women's groups, the churches, uh, to demand uh, uh, equity. Uh, fairness, uh, social and economic justice, and to scrutinize those who make decisions on behalf of the people. That's what a vigorous civil society is all about. And when I attend conferences such as this here in Ghana, I see uh, African civil society becoming more vocal and more vigorous. And I think that's something that we as politicians should welcome. It's not easy for us to welcome it. And I can assure you, having spent my life in politics, one doesn't like always being <laughs> held to account by strident <laughs> civil society organizations. But it's good for us as individuals, as politicians. It's good also for the, uh, uh, f for, for the country. But the important thing is that Ghana and Africa should set their own objectives and not have them set uh, by people in London or Frankfurt uh, uh, Berlin, uh, Beijing, Moscow, New York, or wherever. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it has to be set here in Ghana and in Africa, in Addis Ababa, in Nairobi, uh, in the other places where Pan African institutions uh, 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 meet. You know, that's the uh, that's the the priority for that Africa should develop its own solutions to its own problems. By all means, looking to international partners mm -hmm. to assist in the process, but the priorities need to be set by Africa for Africans. You see, uh, Paul, um, you might disagree, but I, I basically think that our governance is too Europeanized for who we are. And that's why there's, there's this conflict. Uh, because if you look within our traditional pockets, they are able to govern their small communities, you know, for a long period of time and, uh, you know, quite peacefully and understandably well. And I think that maybe because the people are who the governance system is, they're able to adapt. But when it comes to the national level, then we are all over the place because then we have to become white people whether we like it or not. I don't, think that's, I don't think that's fair. Um, I'm a great supporter of uh, African traditional leadership. Um, I'm a great supporter of Africa determining its own constitutional arrangements. Uh, and indeed, when you look at the history of Ghana, you see the way there has been over the years a vigorous debate about uh, how uh, Ghanaian constitutional institutions should develop. And they've changed, developed, matured uh, over the years. Uh, from a time in which uh, you had a straight Westminster model, then you had a one-party state, then you had military rule, then you had different other iterations uh, of the Constitution. Uh, Ghana has now reached a point in which it has vigorous democratic political debates, in which it has a uh, strong and respected uh, judiciary, uh, in which it is able to manage uh, its constitutional affairs in a way that is peaceful and indeed the envy of many others uh, 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 globally. So I think we should celebrate uh, Ghanaian constitutionalism. But that doesn't mean that we can't constantly be striving to improve uh, 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 the democratic institutions as agents uh, of development. And I would agree with you 
uh, Parliament hasn't always been involved in the developmental process uh, uh, globally uh, uh, in the way that it should be. That too, I think, is beginning to change. Parliament and parliamentary committees are getting stronger, holding ministers and governments more effectively to, the, to account all over uh, the uh, uh, continent. But when it comes to development, I am myself am a great believer in having national plans uh, which have a degree of bipartisan buy-in that are the subject uh, of widespread consultation with civil society. So you have a consensus about where the nation wants to be going over a 10, 15, 20 year uh, uh, period. But within that, you will always have uh, political debate. You will have different emphasis, different uh, prior priorities. That's right, that's natural. Uh, and that's just part uh, of a maturing uh, uh, de uh, democracy. But sh can we and should we strive to make our democratic institutions more pro-development? Should we strive to make them better able to listen and to reflect the concerns of the whole community? Of course, that's an ongoing process. Believe you me, it is in the United Kingdom. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> democracy I is by no means perfect uh, in in the UK. Uh, that's been revealed time and time again. When I was in the Treasury, we had to strive very hard uh, to listen uh, more carefully and to reflect the concerns of young people, uh, of, uh, of uh, women, uh, because both those groups are very often uh, the subject of disadvantage and in some instances uh, uh, dis uh, discrimination. And certainly, as we've been looking in the course of this conference at the equalities uh, agenda, it's very clear that we need, as a continent, to be thinking more about how we create sustainable jobs uh, for uh, young people, uh, how, uh, both in towns uh, and in rural areas, how also we ensure that women, women on the farm, you know, look, 60% of the world's remaining uh, uh, arable land is uh, in uh, Africa. Uh, more than 50% of the people of uh, Africa rely on rural areas uh, for livelihoods. Mm -hmm. More than half of them are women. So when we invest in agriculture, we invest in the most productive part of our economy. And yet, Africa is still failing to uh, meet the targets that have been set uh, uh, for investment I in uh, agriculture. 10% uh, of uh, uh, national budgets committed, uh, according to the AU declaration, to agriculture. Ghana was one of the few countries that got anywhere near that uh, in terms of its budgetary uh, uh, allocations. So there's still a lot to be done. Uh, and uh, civil society, the private sector, government, all working together, including the traditional leadership, must be part of the solution to the problems of service delivery that the continent undoubtedly faces. With the speed at which the globe is moving now and uh, the level where we are as a continent, can we catch up with this type of divisive uh, politics? Can we, ca can we well, catch up? Well, you know, there's a... Uh, there's Aren't a we stifling our uh, development? You talk about catching up. Um, there is a, a, a West African uh, proverb uh, that the person who came first to the kitchen, the person who started to cook first, is likely to have broken more pots. So it isn't a question of catching up. It's a question of learning from the mistakes that have been made in the West, in the North, uh, leapfrogging. So, uh, and so uh, going on to the next stage of development. That's why I put this emphasis uh, on the importance of science, technology, and innovation. And if you take uh, the field of, inf of uh, ICT, uh, communications uh, t technology, uh, when it comes to banking and mobile telephony, Africa has leapfrogged the rest uh, of the world. So money transfers are taking place using mobile phones now in a way that is the envy uh, of uh, the West. We in the UK now are looking at technology developed in Kenya in order to promote money transfers using our mobile phones. So, you know, we don't have to uh, make the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. 
uh, we don't have to go through the whole processes that the West and the North uh, have, uh, ha have gone through. We ourselves can be innovators and we must uh, ensure that our education, our policy uh, promotes uh, innovation, uh, promotes capacity building and does so in ways that recognize that in uh, Africa innovation can occur not just in towns and in cities and in universities but in the rural area. When it came to the growing of uh, cassava, my uh, paternal grandmother in Achimtafo uh, was an innovator. You know, uh, she could uh, uh, teach uh, 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 people today a thing or two about how you maximize uh, cassava yields. My paternal grandfather, a cocoa farmer, utilized uh, the expertise of the uh, West African Cocoa Research Institute, as was the Ghana Cocoa Research Institute, as is uh, in uh, TAFO, in order to maximize uh, his uh, cocoa uh, uh, yield. So, you know, we've got to recognize that innovators can be found all over the country. And we want policies that support innovation and spread good practice. And uh, the strength of this Pan-African conference, of course, is that it is looking at Pan-African, at regional and continental solutions to some of the issues uh, that uh, we face. But education, higher education, science, technology, innovation has to be part of the way forward if we build uh, a more sustainable uh, and a more uh, equal uh, form of growth uh, here on this continent of Africa. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Well, thank you very much.